Thank you very much for coming. Um, uh, my name's Felicity Cobbing, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I am the Chief Executive and Curator here at the Palestine Exploration Fund. And my thanks go to my colleagues, Ava, John and Elizabeth, for helping me with the organisation and all the tech, because I don't know a thing. <laughs> Um, a few housekeeping notices. If there's a fire, there's the door. Um, so just run out of there and run round to Waitrose, where there's the assembly point, which is a very civilised way to do it, in my opinion. Um, and any questions about anything or anything else, ask myself, Ava, John, or Elizabeth, who's standing there at the back. Now then, a little bit about the PEF, again, for those of you who don't know. Uh, the PEF was established in 1865, uh, for the academic study and exploration of the Southern Levant, and it's the world's oldest society for the study of this region. Uh, we pioneered the uh, um, subjects of geography, ancient history, archaeology and architecture, and ethnography, as well as the use of photography as a tool of study and record. So tonight's lecture on sacred architecture uh, and exploration of Al-Aqsa Mosque is very much up our alley. And uh, for those of you who don't know Bashar, who's giving our talk tonight, I'm going to give just a brief introduction about him. For those of you who know, you know. <laughs> so Bashar's passion for photography, exploration and history has dominated his life for the past 18 years. Living in Jordan, surrounded by historical treasures, highly, highly influenced his interests and outlook. He primarily focuses on sites of historical, cultural, and significance, and has traveled extensively, photographing over 400 locations internationally, as well as 300 in Jordan. So over to you, Bashar. Great. <laughs> well, hello, guys. This is great because it's like nice and intimate, so we can uh, have, a, have a, like, a lovely little chat. Um, I'm going to try to, uh, basically I'm going to walk you guys through uh, what I've done over the last two years, three years of photography and work. Um, right before COVID, I was exploring um, Jerusalem just on a, on a whim, like doing some standard photography, like nothing special. And when I was out there, I was looking for a specialized book on the, on the site of Al-Aqsa. And to my surprise, there were none. And uh, so a light bulb, you know, bloomed in my head. And this, I decided that this was going to be my next project, especially because I'm so passionate about the complex. Uh, I visited it multiple times over the years, and I've done lots of photography there. So it was always already I already had a good foundation of it. Um, so right before lockdown, I went and spent a good two weeks out there exploring and uh, documenting every single uh, landmark and inscription, just generally exploring the whole thing. Um, just so you know, what you see here on the screen is a map of the uh, complex. It's 144 acres and contains uh, an incredible amount of history. Uh, almost every single empire that's come through the region has actually uh, tried to leave their mark. You know, empire, king, sultan, everything, anything you can imagine, frankly. Um, what we're going to do is... Uh, we're going to, uh, well, ha I'm going to go through the, the images in a style of how my book that's forthcoming in, the, in a few months is going to be done. So what I've done, planned it out is, I'll just go back one second. If you can no see the central platform, I've decided to uh, lay out the story as a compass. So, you know, the, the, we've got the shrine and the sample, central platform in the middle. So that's, you know, the first section. And then we've got the north, the south, the east and the western sections. So, starting from the middle, the middle point and the Golden Dome. Um, we've got uh, the famous shrine and mosque, uh, the Dome of the Rock. And um, many people always mix up the, the, the uh, structures. They always think that this is the mosque, but it actually isn't. It was a uh, structure that was built by the Umayyads uh, to enshrine an exposed section of rock on top of the hill to mark and to venerate the night of ascension that they, you know, the Islam Muslims believe that you know, the Prophet ascended to heaven on, known in Arabic as al-Isra' al-Mi'raj. Um, they originally des designed the, um, there's m a, a few stories about why it was built, and the mo main go idea was to enshrine it and for, to, to develop it for pilgrimage. And that's why it's got like a circular uh, structure to it. Now from what you can see here, uh, the lower section is the original marble that the Umayyads had pla you know, put on it, but the upper section is actually l much later. Uh, the Ottomans came along and, and put their own style of uh, blue, blues and golds. And the Golden Dome also is quite new. It's actually maybe 50 to 60 years old, I think. No, uh, 30 years old. 
from King Hussein who um, had it done. I should warn you, I am a photographer. I am very much uh, in love with this stuff, but I do mix things up. <laughs> um, as you can, I'm going to go like through the images so you can be entertained. Shall we just try to get rid of that yeah, in the corner? Yeah. It's just got it's got a thingy on the top, right? <laughs> no, it won't because it's hidden. Come here. Oh. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, they, uh, so what the Umayyads had done, there, there was originally a mosque in the southern section of, of, the, of the complex, which is the original Al-Aqsa Mosque, also known as Al-Qibli. There's a, there's, uh, as we're going along, I will give you more information about how the naming, because there's, there's a jumble of names about the place. So um, there was the original mosque that the, the, um, the Caliph Omar had constructed in the, in the southern section. But when the Umayyads came along, they wanted to venerate this and they built this structure up. And what they did was they did, built a raised platform uh, and built the shrine on it. And that, uh, that leads us to later on, like talking about other platforms, but like this becomes like a theme throughout the whole co complex platforms. Um, here you can see a section from the northern side with the doors that you can go through. There's like a, a lovely inscription um, from uh, Abdul Malik Marwan. This has got uh, Quranic verses. There's another inscription on the other side that's just a dedicatory um, inscription to him building it and things like this. Um, it, it is a beautiful building. It's one of the most, you know, uh, eye captivating ones with, in certain terms of colors. This was taken in evening, so when they had all the lights on the inside, you can see the windows. Um, and one thing I like to always point out to people is uh, the reuse of um, materials from previous eras. And if you can see at the center of the picture, at the bottom, there's a um, odd-looking uh, piece of marble. And this is a reused marble slab from a, that they had uh, found on the site, and they used it there. And it, it's got two wreaths on the sides, and it would have originally had crosses in, but they were like either rubbed out or removed. Um, oh, here's a close-up view of the tile work, as well as uh, the Quranic verse uh, that talks about Al-Isra al-Mi'raj, the ascension, um, what do you call it, um, a section from the Quran. And it goes all the way around. There are other uh, inscriptions all over the building, um, but mostly are just you know uh, caliphs saying what they had improved, re uh, you know, removed. They, over the years, almost every single structure throughout this uh, the complex has been modified in some way. And until even to this day, we you know you constantly see like improvements. You know, there's clean you know, cleanup operations, all kinds of you know uh, improvements to the to the site. Um, here's a beautiful shot of the interior. <laughs> Um, this was also uh, this has been like this is also a mishmash. On the left, you can you can see on the ceilings these are the Ottoman era uh, modifications to the to the mosque. Whereas you have the uh, a mixture of Fatimid and uh, Mamluk additions along the sides. The inner band is the original Fatimid inscription and Umayyad. Here's a beautiful shot that I got to take from the top. <laughs> I was put on an elevator and raised all the way up so, <laughs> so I could get access to see more of the exposed rock below. It's completely, um, what do you call it, uh, fenced off from, from visitors. People can look over it and look at the rock, but nothing, no one can actually ac access it. Um, and the top there, you can actually see a mo an Ottoman era shrine. And um, uh, I'm not sure how much you guys know about this, but like the Ottomans had a, had a very strong, um, uh, what do you call it, relic um, culture. So they used to, uh, move, whenever any, any of their provinces had problems, they would move relics uh, from Islamic history to, to different places. So that shrine there says to have contained uh, hairs from the Prophet. Uh, here's a beautiful shot from the middle, <laughs> from, uh, looking up directly at the dome. Um, I managed to get access with help from the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Awqaf, the Ministry of Awqaf, and as well as the uh, Hashemites, Royal Hashemites, they got me access to this, so I managed to go back. The first few times I went, I went in as a tourist, and I just wandered around, <laughs> and, and then when I had to get access to the more, you know, uh, eluding places, then that's when I went and got back permissions, and it took me about two years to get the permissions for them, but finally got in. Uh, here's a zoomed-in version of that. 
This is uh, stucco, but you can actually see the mosaic ring. This is, so these are mosaics on the sides, and in the middle it's uh, woodwork and, uh, and uh, stucco. Okay, and it's also uh, been uh, completely renovated recently, like they repainted the whole thing. Uh, this is what an average uh, visitor would actually see from the ground when they come to visit the rock. And that's another version, of, like another view of the Ottoman addition to the side of the rock. So moving on, we're going outside of the building. I'm going to show you a number of the domes. So uh, there was a, a number of domes exist around the central platform. Uh, each has varying um, uh, possible you know, uses. The first one is the dome of the chain, which is absolutely beautiful. And um, no one particularly knows what it's used for. Uh, the, the, the theories are that it's either a mock-up of what the, the Dome of the Rock was going to look like, or it was a, supposedly a treasury, but no one... Then this is a common theme that you see <laughs> when you're trying to research about this place. Like, um, you constantly have this sort of, we don't really know, we suspect it might be A or B, but there's no proof or it's been lost into time. Um, here's the interior of it. So that's all tile work on the inside, out, top and bottom. Uh, this is a, another um, dome, and this one specifically uh, was designed because there's an exposed section of the, the rock as well. So in Muslim tradition, like they, you know, they, they say that the Prophet came and he was ascended to heaven on the rock. So they, they don't re particularly know exactly where that was. So wherever there was exposed sections of rock, they would be, build a dome on top of it to protect that section in the central platform. Of course, in the northern sections, they, there's also exposed sections, that they, but they have not done anything. There's actually, they're actually carved away. Um, this is another dome, but this one has a different uh, specific meaning. This, has, this arose out of uh, the legend of Al-Khadr, who is a um, mystic figure in all, all Abrahamic uh, religions. And legend has it that Al-Khadr, uh, who is one of the three people who are immortal in Islam, uh, visits uh, Jerusalem every Ramadan and spends Ramadan there. So at some point, possibly during the uh, Fatimid era, this was constructed you know, as a thing. And there's an, even a Sufi uh, Zawiya right underneath it. Um, this is, uh, you can see the Dome of a Ascension, and behind it is the Dome of the Prophet. Both are protecting um, exposed pieces of rock. And the really interesting thing about the Ascension is that it was built by the uh, Ayyubids, so that's Salah al-Din post-Crusades. Uh, and uh, you can actually kind of see that they reused Crusader-era uh, construction materials. It looks very, very Crusader and Gothic in, in style. And there's a big argument whether uh, this is originally Umayyad or it was actually existed prior and they just cleaned it up and re reused it. Uh, another very interesting thing is like uh, legend, you know, permeates this place. And um, an, a great example of how legends change things, uh, the two names of these two domes were switched up until maybe 300 or 400 years ago. And for some reason, the Dome of the Prophet became the Dome of Ascension and the, the, the vice versa. And no one actually knows. And now everyone calls them <laughs> they're by their names. This is a front view of that, of the uh, Dome of Ascension. And uh, you can actually see, I, I took a zoomed in shot for you guys to t see this very, to me it looks very gothic. So I'm pretty sure they've, they've reused some of the elements. Um, a nice view of the uh, Prophet's dome. A Islamic tradition holds that this is the actual point where the Prophet, when he returned, and uh, the tradition holds that like, he prayed with all the other um, religious and Abrahamic figures. So this is a dedicatory shrine to that as well. Um, on the surrounding area of the platform during the Ottoman era, uh, the Ottomans, um, I should rewind a little bit and tell you about like over the centuries, because the, um, the religious, um, that's how, how do we put this? In the beginning, it was only the sultans who could actually build things, you know, the caliphs who were allowed to build things on the central platform and around. And then as time went on, it became, it transformed to from governors to wealth, wealthy merchants and so on. But they usually sort of moved outwards from the central platform because they had already built, built stuff. So during the Ottoman era, there was a, uh, um, a huge movement to build cells, Sufi cells. Uh, Sufis are mi uh, Muslim mystics, for those who don't know. Um, and it was a sort of like a way of, you know, in, like endowing and making the place even more holy. So they built these 
cells all around the edges of the um, of the platform, and over time they've been reused and reused. So in the beginning they were, you know, dedicated to certain Sufis who would stay, spend their days in there, and then later on it became residences for visiting dignitaries, and now it's being used by the uh, Ministry of Religious Affairs for different offices. So it's still in use, and very interesting. <laughs> well, this is the beautiful thing about how I got access because I was going during uh, when uh, during hours when it was only only the Muslims were allowed to enter. So um, there are two periods when the tourists get to come and go, and that's usually full of people. And then there's the quieter times around sunset and around early mornings where you just wander around. And this is something else that I would I was going to bring up, but I'll bring it up now. Um, uh, despite the chaos and this place being like a flashpoint for the entire world, uh, like for the entire region, um, in its quieter moments, it's one of the most wonderful uh, atmospheric places I've ever visited. It's not only a, uh, you know, a religious complex, it's a public park, um, it's a, a school district, it's a place where you know, the Palestinians and the Jerusalemites can come and you know, not be hassled and just experience some green. Um, and so, like, you know, I, when I was going, I was going at certain, like, specific times. I mean, I spent about a month photographing, a month of days <laughs> out there. And um, so I usually, in terms of times of day, it's either early morning or at the night, you know, to get the nice colors and things. What time of the year did you go out? Uh, mostly spring. Spring and uh, winter. Here's another separate dome, that, since we're on the note of domes. This is called the Grammar Dome, and it was built during uh, the Ayyubid period. And again, you can see on the doorways, there's... Crusader spoiler being reused uh, uh, in the uh, structure. And this, was, um, this is called the Grammar do Dome because grammar was taught there, and it still is. But I think over the last few years, it's been transformed into another set of offices for the Oqaf. Um, here's uh, a section from uh, looking from uh, the outside. I wanted to show you guys how high this platform is compared to the rest of the area. And you can also see more cells on each of the sides. Um, again, um, you can see, like, this is another image for you guys just to see how high it was raised. And uh, back in the day when it was first constructed, it was just, it was raised and um, it had marble flooring. But the rest of the complex was muddy. And this leads me to the next section, which was uh, the next bit I was going to tell you about, which is uh, platforms that were endowed to the, th to the complex itself by religious people for separate, you know, for teaching and schooling. Uh, we'll, we'll, I'll, you'll get a better picture of what, it, what I'll, I'm telling you about. So now I've gone back to the map so to show you. We've just covered the center bit with the dome in the middle. And you can see the archways and the staircases and the domes dotted throughout. So next thing we're going to do is we're going to be looking at the northern section, which I call the school district because it's um, very, uh, it was during the um, Mamluk period. And uh, the Ottoman period, it was also very popular to build schools religious schools, so the place is absolutely filled with them. And they're still used till this day, so when, whenever you're out there, you go up nor to the northern section, you'll find kids playing football, teachers screaming at them to come back to class, uh, you'll get to see. So this is one of the gates. Um, there's about um, eight or nine gates throughout the whole complex, entrances for the, for the, uh, for the Muslims. Um, here's an example of the Northern Arcade, which was uh, bricked up in the uh, 80s and used as school. So these are all classrooms that you can see. <laughs> and that's one of the minarets in the northern section. As it moves on, there's another uh, gate that you can see through with a Ottoman era school on top of it. Um, here's an example of these beautiful schools that they were building. And it, they used to have like this sort of thing, and you know, who was wealthy enough to build more schools to endow, and, like, you know, and it was all different factions who were building all these beautiful things. So there's a mixture of Mamluk era, uh, Ottoman era, and uh, so on. Um, the, uh, water also plays a huge role in, in the complex. And um, this is an example of uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, or the Lawgiver, built this when, he, when they took over Jerusalem. And this is a water fountain or where people can prefer, perform wudu. Um, there uh, are loads all over the place. And sometimes like, what would happen was they would be combined with other aspects of religious um, architecture. So you'd have a, you know, a fountain, but would be connected to a platform. So I think we're going to move on. So this is another direct view with the inscription by Suleiman the Magnificent dedicating it. 
Here's a, a really beautiful um, E1 uh, or pavilion that was built. Um, again, it's also lost to time. So some suspect it's a platform raised. So just so, I, uh, so you guys get a better picture of what platforms were, these were uh, raised uh, clean spots that weren't muddy where people could come and give religious lessons or if they, were, they didn't have time to reach the, the mosque at the southern end, they would pray on these platforms. So you'd have, you know, um, Qiblas and things like this, so like they would know which way to pray. And people would come and give religious lessons here. And they, of course, you have all different schools of Islamic teachings. So, like, you know, different Islamic sects would come and have their own platforms throughout the, uh, throughout the uh, complex. Here's the interior with two columns that have been reused from God knows where. Nobody knows. <laughs> Nobody knows. Um, here's a form, a dome of the, in, the nor in the northern section. This is called the Dome of Suleiman. Uh, everyone thinks it's Prophet Suleiman, but it's not Solomon. It's actually the, um, the Ottoman Caliph. Um, it houses a section of rock, exposed rock as well. And in front of it is a perfect example of a uh, platform that I've been telling you about. So these are dotted all over the place. They're countless ones. Um, by my count, I think I've, I've photographed about 50 or 60 of them throughout. And every single time I go back, I find more. <laughs> and the northern section is also, the northern and eastern sections are also filled with uh, olive trees, uh, which is really beautiful. And it is a very, very picnicky area where, where people go to. Um, here's another uh, one of the uh, minarets that's connected to the outer rim of the complex. Uh, we're moving on from there. We're going, now we're going to go uh, look at the western side of the, uh, of the uh, complex. Now, one thing you have to know is the western side and the northern side are the sides connected to the city. The east and southern, the southern one's blocked off because it dro drops down into to a valley. And the eastern side is the outer walls of the city and also the graveyard. So access would have come mainly, all the people would flood through this section. And this gives this area a completely different feel because there's a lot of these platforms for people to access, uh, fountains and schools. So here's an example of one of the, the schools in the, northern, in the eastern section, uh, sorry, western section. Uh, and there's also arcades underneath, but these haven't been bricked up over the years. So you've got these lovely arcades uh, with the doorways to the old schools. And the really interesting thing about it is because this is close now, uh, closer to the city, these schools have stopped being used and have been transformed into tombs for, to, you know, for, and modern tombs for people who have, you know, of significance or of note to be buried here. Uh, this particular tomb ho is home to uh, one of the Ottoman governors who uh, built uh, some of these platforms. Here's another one of the entrances with the platform in front of it. Uh, again, more platforms, as you can see. I wanted to give you, a, uh, show you like a ver the variety that you see in the different styles. And of course, these, you know, differentiate there of centuries between some of them. Um, some of them actually have fountains, water fountains connected to them. While others have massive um, for fountains on the sides. One of the most interesting ones that I love is this one. It's called the Sha'alan fountain. And uh, so it's, it's a cell, which I mentioned early on with, for Sufis. It's a fountain, uh, which you can see on the bottom, and it also has a platform extending outside. <laughs> so it's a one-stop shop for, for uh, who built it. But the, really inter the more interesting thing is nobody knows what the original name of the place was. This is the Sha'alan fountain because the Sha'alan family used to be water carriers. And for the last few centuries, <laughs> they're the ones who were used to supply water in that area and, carrying, and used to control the water source, basically. Another uh, form of uh, platform that you can see with uh, a uh, Mamluk era uh, water fountain in the back. This is one of the most beautiful doorways that you can see. This is the Cotton Merchant's Gate and uh, absolutely gorgeous piece of Mamluk architecture. And uh, it's connected. I wanted to share a couple of shots, but I thought it was, there were too many. <laughs> so you can, you, what, what would be happening here is that they would have built, well, it still exists, is a beautiful uh, covered market inside with a hammam, like traditional Fatimid style. They would always do this whenever they would go to new cities. And it still exists till this day. So they, they you just go this long hallway full of markets and things along the sides. Uh, here's another version of the tombs, uh, reused schools along the same arcade. And I've even got a lovely picture of the interior. Um, this is the tomb of um, 
uh, I think it was, I'm trying to look it up really quickly. <laughs> ah, tomb of Sharif Hussain, uh, who established, uh, or who was like, you know, the, he was the king of the Hejaz for a brief period and was trying to establish a, uh, you know, pan-Arab regional state at the time, but he never really got to do it. But he's buried here. Outside, uh, you can see more schools on the upper level, an empty arcade with the tombs behind it, and as well, you've got the uh, water fountains. And like you, again, you get mixtures. So you know the arcades are possibly um, you know early Islamic, whereas you've got late Islamic school on top of that, and middle Islamic, you know Egyptian in the center. It's just this eclectic mix of architecture from every single area. Um, here, here is a very interesting fountain. This is called the Fountain of the Oranges because there used to be an orange tree next to it, but it's sadly gone now. <laughs> And uh, in front of it is the, the most famous school. It's called the Ashrafiya School, and it was called the third jewel of the Haram uh, because of its beautiful architecture, which you can actually see some detailing on now. Uh, currently, it's used as a girls' school. Uh, moving on, we're moving so uh, southwards towards the uh, the bottom of the complex, and there's a continuing continuous amount of these extra pieces of ele or extra elements that you, you know, the people were using. So um, this is the uh, dome of Mu Musa Moses, but pe again, people used to think it was Moses the prophet, but it actually might be one of the caliphs. <laughs> um, but it's the really interesting story. Again, what you can see, can you see the platform raised above it? Um, the, other, the interesting thing is that this is a, um, a structure that was built for me the memorization of the Qur'an. And it was one of the first structures built in the Middle East. And it's still used to the, today. Um, here's what, another one of the main entrances. This was the central uh, entrance of the, um, uh, of the Haram. And this would have been used by the bulk of the, the majority of the population of Jerusalem to enter. It used to be a double gate, but now sadly it's only a single gate because they try to control who's coming and going. Um, above that is the minaret. There are four minarets connected to this, and each one is from a particular period, but most of them have been reconstructed over the last uh, hundred years because of earthquakes and collapses. Um, here we're almost at the southern end, and this is quite an interesting story. So here on the right is a small uh, prayer hall called the Burak uh, prayer hall. And the Burak is uh, the animal in which the Prophet uh, had uh, rode on to uh, Jerusalem on the night of Isra and Mi'raj. And it's, it's sort of like a pegasus, but it also has human features to it. Um, uh, this used to actually be an access tunnel from the, f because uh, as we head south, the platform is, becomes raised as the city dips down. So the, um, there was an area called the Moroccan Quarter in which the uh, North Africans used to live. And these people, when, they went to, when it was time for prayer, they would come through this tunnel, ascend, and come up into the platform. But as the years increased and, you know, the city grew and the layers upon layers uh, you know, were built on top of each other, a second door behind it was built where people could directly access it and the tunnel was closed off. So uh, here's the entrance that you can see that's sealed off. Um, but more recently, because of, uh, you know, the, the number, the sheer number of worshippers who come through, um, uh, they've, they've been transforming different sections that were, you weren't used prior into modern uh, prayer halls. So this has been converted into a prayer hall. But because of um, its close association to the wall, uh, of, called the Wailing Wall, but also known in Islam as the Wall of Burak, um, the mosque or the, the prayer hall has be been called the, the prayer, uh, Masal al-Burak, sorry. <laughs> and this is... Um, like a sort of an example of legend, like, you know, following legend. So like this was originally just a tunnel, but then all of a sudden it became closed off and became a prayer hall. And then legend rose around it because of its asso close association to the wall close by. And it be took on its own form. So when, sometimes when you pe meet people in there, they'll be like, is this where, you know, this, the, the whole story happened? And you're like, no, this is, you know, legend that's arose over the centuries. And this is something that happens throughout the entire site. Now we're going to be looking at the southern section. Um, obviously, you can see the bottom, that's the main mosque. 
And uh, if you can see the dots on the right and left, those are remaining rem remnants of columns because the mosque used to be much, much larger. But due to an earthquake, it collapsed and they re only reconstructed. It used to be 18, um, what do you call it, 18 volts. And now it's only about eight or half the size of it we, what it used to be. But we'll move on. So that's the, that's the uh, uh, mosque in the south. Now, just going back to the naming, naming conventions that I was telling you about. So the complex is called Al-Aqsa. Uh, or Al-Haram al-Sharif, the Noble Sanctuary. Um, the southern section is the Aqsa Mosque, or also the covered Aqsa Mosque, Al-Qibli. Uh, um, so, you know, it, the, naming, the name varies. The Palestinians know this because they live there, in it, but it's very confusing to everyone else. <laughs> um, so this is the exterior from both sides. And in front, here's a nice shot of the uh, main entrance with um, the Kas water fountain in front. And apparently this uh, water fountain is fed by a five mile or six mile aqueduct uh, that, that feeds it from, from uh, a spring close to Bethlehem, I think someone has mentioned. Um, and it's still in use today. Some detailing on the outside with all the inscriptions. Uh, this is an interesting se section on the left-hand side. So this is two different dynasties. And if you can guess by the window on the left, this is a Crusader era window <laughs> um, with a, a Fatimid or Mamluk era uh, doorway on the right. And uh, during the Crusades, the, the whole compound was taken over by the Crusaders. And this was the seat of power of the, of the kings of Jerusalem and queens of Jerusalem. Um, uh, for a number of years before they moved out to one of the citadels outside the city. But the Templars later on, later on took it over and reused the structures. So every single structure will, would have had like stories to it. But one very interesting thing about the interior, as you enter, the interior back, the Crusaders didn't really destroy anything. They just plastered it up and made their own rooms. Uh, so when the Ayyubids under Salah ad-Din retook it, they managed to restore a lot of the uh, ancient interior. Um, here is a beautiful mosaic panel from the early days, from early Islamic, the early Islamic period. Um, the roof is actually quite modern because it was burnt down in, this, in the 1969, but restored recently under the Hashemites. As you go deeper inside, here's a lovely detailed shot of the, fl uh, the, fl the fl floral patterns, as well as an inscription on top. And you can see, uh, here's another note of like, you know, um, rulers, you know, uh, ha adding their own voices to things. If you look in the top left corner, someone's added an extra note on the, on the inscription in a later period. Uh, we're moving into the central vault. Here's a lovely shot of the dome. And uh, here's a ni nice shot of the main area with the uh, Mihrab, as well as the uh, Mihrab of Salah ad-Din, that, were, that there's also, was also burnt down in the late, seven, uh, late 60s and reconstructed as well recently. Detailing of the mosaic inscription above, above the, uh, what do you call it, arch. Uh, well, I added these two pictures because I also wanted to show you that like, this place is still very vibrant and much in use. Right next to the mosque, right outside, is the window factory. And uh, it's purely made out of, by hand, all the windows of, of the structures that you see are p made out of hand using uh, plaster and glass. And it takes them, you know, three to six months to make each individual window. And uh, like I was, I only got, ma I only managed to get access to this recently and I was blown away of how beautiful, like, and how they reuse these sections. And uh, how it's sort of everything is located inside. You know, you've got the administration, you've got the Oqaf, you've still got worshippers. And it's, a, it's another addition to this beautiful complex. There's another uh, former uh, Sufi lodge um, that's now the uh, marble factory. So anything that's destroyed, they, they, have, they take over. None of it is made outside. Like only the certain elements are produced outside and brought in. Um, uh, on the left of the, uh, of the Grand Mosque is, are there are two other mosques. One's called the Women's Mosque, which is now converted into a lovely library. And there's also another, oh, that's the uh, other minaret of the structure. And then you have the, uh, the Mosque of the Moroccans. And like, uh, it's 
kind of um, uh, misleading. When you think of Moroccans, you think of Morocco, but this actually means Moroccans as in the North Africans, because they were a separate school from the Jerusalemites, uh, an Islamic school. And now it's actually the uh, museum. It's been converted into the museum. Underneath the, uh, the, the Grand Mosque that we just saw is a beautiful thing. They, another misleading title, this is called the Old Mosque, the Old Al-Aqsa Mosque, but actually it was a tunnel that connected the Umayyad era palaces outside the city to the, to the main uh, complex. And you can see a lot of the beautiful ancient detailing on the domes above. But um, they've been sealed off and also turned into lovely libraries. So this is one of the biggest libraries in the, on the, in the thing and it's right underground. And, you know, as you're walking around, uh, um, you find, you know, groups of people teaching still, you know, groups of women, you know, memorizing the Quran. It's very active. It's very, like, lively. I didn't, ma I didn't want to add more pictures, but, like, I have a, that's a whole other talk about the life on the, <laughs> on the, uh, in the complex. Um, right above that is a, uh, a big air empty area, but this is now known as the Marwanid uh, prayer palace underneath it. Now, when the original mosque was built, we don't know who built, it, built these vaults. Like, it's argued that it, might, it was probably the Umayyads, but like it, some people say it predates the Umayyads. So uh, the southern edge of the complex dips down into a valley. So what they had done was they had bu uh, built these massive arched vaults to make, continue this, uh, this, you know, the platform. And so when you go downstairs, this is the entrance, the modern entrance that they had built um, in the last 20 years you get to see the modern, uh, they've repurposed the modern vaults. So during the Crusades, these were, these were stables <laughs> that the Crusaders used, and the Crusaders called them the Stables of Solomon, uh, but now are used as a massive uh, prayer uh, area. It, it's quite large. Apparently, it, it fits about six to 7,000 people. That's how huge it is. Um, and a very, very interesting thing, in the farthest corner, is a little room with this dome in it. And it's an Ottoman wooden dome called the Cradle of Jesus. And this is another thing about like, you know, how legend, you know, pushes legend. So apparently at one point there was an inscription uh, during the um, Fatimid period. Uh, the Fatimids were, again, go back for those who don't know, the Fatimids were the Egyptian rulers before the Crusades. And there was this inscription that said, that claims that uh, Mary had stayed in this area. So push four centuries later, when the Kaiser was visiting from Germany, the Ottomans built this dome, and nobody really knows, understands why they built this dome, possibly to commemorate this legend that has arisen, or uh, we don't really know. But it's also really interesting because there's a reused uh, Byzantine era basin on the bottom uh, of the dome. So that's the southern section. Now we're moving to the final section, which is on the right. And this is, I call this the quiet section because it's, it's the furthest from er, any sort of human activity. Um, so it's just filled with olive trees. There's a bit of a tip there as well for any of the, <laughs> for, for a dump for the you know, rocks and things. And there's about 10 different platforms on this side as well. Um, we'll just go through. This is what it looks like as you're walking along. Um, you can see also it runs along the city walls. So these are the modern Ottoman walls and fortifications that were built. Here's an example of a very unique platform, the circular platform, as well as this is one, this is called the platform of olives. <laughs> uh, this is the, the most interesting element of that side. This is called the uh, gate of uh, remission or the golden gate. And this opens up into the graveyard outside, but it's been sealed off for centuries. And again, it's been repurposed as a prayer hall. Um, uh, this place is also really famous for the, a very famous uh, Muslim scholar called Al-Ghazali, if everybody really knows who this person is. Apparently he came and spent a few months here and it really influenced his writings. And he's, he's noted as one of the scholars who uh, reformed or a reformer of, of Islam at the time. Um, so like his rooms would have been on top in, 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 uh, above these domes. Uh, this is an example of, a, a this is the other side of the gate but now sealed off, showing you also the Muslim cemetery outside. And um, 
that's uh, that's rounding off uh, like my quick tour of uh, of a uh, photographic tour of the uh, of the haram as you can see we've uh, we've gone out throughout it you could, that's the that's the southern uh, mosque which i told you about the central shrine the outer eastern fortifications and the city on the interior we've lost the last shot but that's is great <laughs> and that, that's uh, that's my uh, my work so far, um, I'm working on uh, developing a book, like I said. It's going to be coming out at the end of the year, hopefully, if things work well. Uh, well. Um, my project actually contains about 130 sites explored with writings by Dr. Robert Schick, who's a very eminent scholar on the site, and he, know, he's know, he knows his stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, <laughs> hopefully we can uh, move on to, like, questions and answers, if you guys have got any. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is such a nice way to spend <laughs> the evening looking at fantastic photographs. One thing that occurred to me is that you, there's this tradition of putting your own mark on, 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 the, on the building, on, on the enclosure. And, <clears throat> but, but the examples that you show, they all date to the 19th century and earlier. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I imagine that it's quite a complicated thing nowadays. It's to extremely do something complicated. Like that. Yes. Um, but it would be wonderful, wouldn't it? If some, because also, you know, Islamic architecture is something that has evolved so much since. Yeah. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see a 21st century little shrine, a little they, dome? Well, they, know, they do. Corner? Like there are a lot of the modern platforms are, are dated to the recent dec few decades, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of there's a couple of new, brand new fountains that they've okay. managed to build. That's so they good. are still marking their okay. territory. Uh, but not in the grand fashion, not quite you know. Well, yeah. And like, for example, the lower area above it, like that, this, all, the, all this, you know, marbled area that you've been seeing in, in the southern section is all modern. Yeah. It used to be muddy, and like, you know, people would, you know, apparently there's stories of uh, them having to put down wooden planks from the central shrine to the mosque, so people could didn't have to put their shoes back on when crossing. You know things like this. <laughs> but King Hussein's regilding. Oh yes, the the dome. Yeah, that's yeah. very much. And that's that's, that's a big statement as well. In the, so in uh, the nineties. So for point, those who yeah. don't know, the uh, the dome, the central golden dome that you guys see, um, was actually the same color as the Qibli Mosque. It was this the dark, yeah. a dark lead yeah. dome, and um, King Hussein funded the the gilding of this. And there's a, actually a political theme to it, like a, the Hashemite, a Hashemite stamp to it, because at the time, according to some sources, the Saudis wanted to, you know, uh, pay for this gilding, and so the Hashemites said, well, no, we're the custodians, we're responsible for this, so we will fund this. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions or comments? John? Yeah, you showed us uh, quite a lot of windows and doors of parts of buildings um, dating to the Crusader period. And I just wondered whether on the site itself, I know outside in Jerusalem more generally there's quite a lot of crusader material, but actually on the site, is, is, are there any intact buildings which... On the site? Other yeah. than that circular gothic window that you saw, yeah. that's the most, uh, the most crusader section of the whole place that right. remains. Whereas you see the domes that have reused the Crusader spoiler, some of the gates also have reused Crusader spoiler in the arches and in the columns on the sides. But an actual physical building, not not I really. I just wonder because you had shown us yeah. how the Christians, the Crusaders, yeah. used uh, buildings and the Al Aqsa Mosque itself uh, and converted it presumably into a, a church, into yeah. a Christian church. And I just wondered if any of the Crusader buildings had been at a later date converted into mosques. No, no, not that, not to my knowledge, honestly. Like I don't think so, because all of these structures were already there and being were heavy use before they was conquered and taken over. Yeah. So they were just adapted. Uh, to my knowledge, again, <laughs> if I do sure find out, right. I'll definitely sure tell you. Know. you. <laughs> Hi, you lost me in the on a tiny thing earlier in the narrative when you said this is actually isn't a mosque. This was built as a site of veneration or something. Yes. And then. Uh, um, and then I didn't catch at what point it became. No one knows honestly. Like, sir, it's again, it's one of those things that were so used, 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 and then every single time once someone to come, wanted to come and put their marker, they built a niche or they built a mihrab and they built something, and it would solely turn into a prayer hall. I mean, the whole site is considered holy, so you could technically pray, pray in any section of the of the mosque complex. 
Um, I just backed straight away saying this was not originally in Moscow. Yeah, yeah, it, it wasn't. Well, it, so it was intended as a, like I said, a, 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 a place of pilgrimage. But obviously, as Muslims visit the place, they would want to pray in it. But uh, like, it's designed also in a, in a circular fashion for people to uh, go around, similar to the Kaaba in Mecca. But that was never really used. Like it just it just transformed into this shrine and so on. In fact, is the whole area regarded as the Al Aqsa Mosque? Yes. Yeah. So yeah. it's all a mosque. Yes, the whole thing. So you can pray yeah. anywhere you want, considering and like. But like obviously there was muddy patches, so that's why they had to build these platforms for people to play on. But now you can pick any corner and pray. You and it's classed mm -hmm. as you praying in the mosque itself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for uh, really fascinating. I'm, I'm Interested in the blue color on the dome? Yeah. Is it is it lapis lazuli? Yes, it is, and it's from Izmir. It's Izmir tile from uh, from Turkey. So the, it's definitely the Ottoman stamp on the site because they were they populated that sort of they brought it in from Central Asia and stuff like. So it is lapis lazuli well, that, mixed that, in that, with that, the tile the, work. The mine was in Afghanistan, wasn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. So so the lapis lazuli went to Izmir. Yeah, and, and transformed into tile and brought down. Yeah, well, <laughs> and and we and they still have right now. So the more detailed, uh, you know, tiles that are damaged are shipped in from Izmir as a replacement. But the ones that are more bland are made in in house on the in the complex and replaced. <laughs> so that was a very interesting fact that I learned when I was out there. Well, yeah, I mean that must have cost an awful lot of money. Oh yes, because that was actually was just. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, it's one of those things where it's, you know, the, the, it's the third holiest site in Islam. So if you leave your mark and if you, you know, it's, a, it's seen as a, you know, you know, if you put your money into it, it a blessing, you know, in terms of these, uh, you know, uh, caliphs and sultans who were taking over. So the money wasn't a question for them. You know, it was one of those endowment things. You know, this is, look how much money we've got. We're spending it on the, on the religious sites and fixing them up. But at the time of Suleiman, um, he was extremely wealthy at the time because of the, the conquest. The Ottoman Empire was at its peak. rolling. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this was kind of bank rolling with God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and one thing I should, I, one interesting thing I should mention: the two calmest periods. That's I mean, I've mentioned it a lot during this. Were the Ottoman and the uh, and the uh, Mamluk eras, and that's why you see so much left over from those periods. The other periods were so chaotic. And the really interesting thing is that these cultures of education, like it became a city of education twice in its history, a major one. And like, for example, during the Mamluk period, you know, disgraced officials used to retire to Jerusalem to become, you know, uh, scholars and things like this uh, and to expand. And that's why you like all the schools are from those two periods. Just as a follow-up, what, what are the opening times to get into the complex? All right, for, for foreigners, <laughs> um, there's the... For th infidels. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, I think there, I think it, it's 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. And then there's the prayer, and then it's 12 till 2, I think. Yeah. And you can only access it through one gate. That's right, and you've got to start queuing. Yeah. Right. But it's, uh, it's not every day, is it, though? Um, I mean, five days a week, I think, yeah, last I checked. Days. And uh, the other thing is that you are not allowed to enter the dome or the, any of the major buildings, even the museum. As a foreigner, you're not allowed. It's for only dedicated, only the Muslims can enter it. Elizabeth, you had a question. And I love how you talked about uh, the atmosphere on the entire um, platform. And I was wondering what your, your interactions were like with the people working there in the workshops, for instance, or did you have contact with the Oh, it was it, honestly, it was amazing. Like people, like you, you see all walks of life. You see the, you know, you see people who are like I said, picnicking, and everybody was. And uh, I could talk about this for hours. <laughs> um, next time. Yeah, next time. <laughs> uh, but you know, like uh, the, the the atmosphere is very unique. Um, like I said, you see all walks of life. You see kids playing football on and on the main platform. You see people picnicking. You see groups of women learning Quran or just hanging out. Um, my interactions with them were, were lovely, like every single time, you know, people come up to me and say, take a picture of me, and I take pictures of them and send them shots, and, you know, they invite me to, to eat with them. Um, uh, the guards of the haram, because I was like this, you know, white person with a camera, they thought I was a foreigner, so like, I constantly get accosted until they all knew me. And as I was walking around, they were like, hi, Bashar, or hi, Mr. Jordan, they would say, you know, like, you know, you know. <laughs> and uh, it grew and grew, and I, I started befriending all of them, so like now I, I know you know, the, the director of the museum, I know the director of the, the guard on the thing, and like I go in and sit with them and they invite me to eat and things like this. And 
it's very interesting. But on the parallel, there's a lot. It's very tense. It's a tense place. You know, I'd be, I'd be dining with the head of security and he'd be constantly having microphones, you know, the, the squawking, you know, something's happening here, something's happening there, people are trying to get in from here, this sort of stuff. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, I suggest that this marks a great point to move to uh, friendly chat and mingling. Yeah. We're um, kind of uh, facilitated with wine and drinks and nibbles at the back. And any more questions or... Um, uh, observations, then um, you can talk among yourselves and share them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.